Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to the ninth annual Ken Sarawiwa Seminar at Maynooth University. The theme of our seminar this evening is Telling and Listening, the Arts in Anti-Racist Practice. I'm your host for the event, and my name is Dr. Ida Corley, and I work in the English department at Maynooth. I'd like to welcome our contributors this evening, poet Oritsi Gbemi, Emmanuel Jackpa, and the documentary filmmaker Sinead O'Brien. Thank you both for joining us. We're absolutely delighted to have you tonight, and we're looking forward to the conversation. In a moment, I'll give the audience a longer introduction to Jack and Sinead and their respective careers. But before we get going, I'd like to thank some of my colleagues who've been working with me behind the scenes to make sure this event will take place despite the ongoing pressures of the pandemic. So first, thanks to Tracy O'Flaherty, our tech wizard in English for her help with Eventbrite and setting up this evening. And thanks also to Deputy Librarian Helen Fallon and Dr. Lawrence Cox in sociology, and to our publisher, Dr. Feroz Manji, for their stellar work with the Ken Sarawiwa Archive over the years, and their help and advice in organizing the event this evening. And thanks also to Professor Lauren Arrington, Head of English and University Librarian Cahill McCauley, for their generous allocation of funding for the event tonight. So I want to show you an image. So if you just give me a moment. Um, tonight we are marking the anniversary, the 26th anniversary of the unlawful execution of writer and activist Ken Sarawiwa by the Abacha-led military dictatorship in Nigeria on the 10th of November in 1995. Sarawiwa always denied any wrongdoing and Amnesty International, Friends of the Earth and other human rights and environmental organizations have described his trial by special military tribunal on charges of incitement to murder as blatantly unfair. They claim he was targeted for protesting the ecological destruction of his homeland Agoni in the Niger Delta by oil and gas multinationals. And indeed, in recent years, Amnesty have called on the British and Dutch governments to investigate the oil giant Shell for potential involvement in the gross human rights violations that took place in Ogoni during the early 90s. So this seminar is dedicated to Ken Sarawiwa, and we hope by remembering him tonight to advance his life goals and to promote and advance the cause of climate justice more generally. During the time that Ken was in prison, he wrote letters to Irish nun and solidarity worker, Sister Magella McCarran, Ola. Um, I think Magella might be listening in tonight, so hello to Magella. Um, the letters are um, in this book, Silence Would Be Treason, and this is available for free online. And Tracy will put the link in the chat for us. So anybody who'd like to read the letters later can do that. The, the letters are also held by Maynooth University Library in our special collections. And they have been quoted in documents that Amnesty have drawn up to make their case for the um, investigation of Shell. We're joined, as I said, by Jack, who was born in Wari in the Niger Delta, and he currently lives in Ireland. He obtained an MFA from Waterford Institute of Technology. He studied poetry at Oxford University, at Stanford University, and the University of Iowa. His poetry has been published widely in journals like Diagram, Echoing Years, Irish Pages, African American Review, and the Edison Literary Review and he's the recipient of the 2007-2008 W.B. Yeats Pierce Loughran Award in Poetry and currently works for the Arts Council of Ireland. Sinead O'Brien is a multi-award winning director, producer, a non-fiction author with a career that has spanned over 20 years. Her films include Luke, Blood Fruit, Maeve Binchy, and other films on Irish playwrights and musicians, and on political and 
literary culture in Ireland and theatre culture in Ireland more generally. During her 20 year career, she's collaborated with Screen Ireland, the BBC, Sky Arts, Northern Ireland, Ireland Screen, RTE, TG Cahir, NRK, on a range of documentary films. And her awards include the Ryark Award, Best Documentary in 2016, the Best Documentary at the Galway Film FLA in 2014, and the IFTA Best Feature Documentary in 2002, and the Irish Music Awards Best Documentary in 2002. So you're very welcome, and we are very happy to have you here tonight, to have both of you here with us tonight um, on the anniversary of Ken Sarawiwa's death. So if I could turn maybe to Jack to begin with. Hello. Jack, yes. <laughs> Could you could you tell me a little bit about why it's important for you to be here tonight? What what this anniversary means to you? Yes. Wow. Thank you very much, uh, Ida, for this uh, opportunity. It's coming very well, right? The sun's coming. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity and, uh, and privilege. Uh, it's it's uh, it's really amazing. Uh, not just uh, any kind of an event, but the day as well. I think uh, it is uh, significant because why we, we gather here at this moment. Uh, many years ago, I was, I was actually in the same location where, uh, where the execution was was uh, taking place in the Delta. So it's, uh, it's even increased the starkness of the contrast uh, that uh, uh, it's like a circle of life, you know? Uh, so it's really, a, it's a, I think it's a personal uh, uh, reflection on with the, uh, something that fills me with uh, a kind of uh, gratitude for life it's a privilege to be alive because it could have been in, um, you know, it could have been me, it could have been anyone at that time. So I think it's, it gives me privilege as well to speak and to be able to uh, sacrifice is sacrifice, you know, someone sacrificed for the, for the stories of the Nigel Delta to be heard. So I think it's a, it's a privilege for me to be able to use this medium to say thank you Ken Sarawiwa for the sacrifice to be able to, uh, to, to bring the, the, the message of the Nigel Delta to the international community. So I think that's why I feel that this is a special moment for me. Jack, you've been in Ireland for 15 years now, but yeah. when we spoke last, you were telling me of your memories of the crisis in the Niger yes. Delta. Yes. I think every Niger Delta Delta nurse, you know, they are, they could uh, confirm with in affirmative uh, of uh, experiences of struggle and um, survival. Uh, because personally, my own uh, father's village was uh, burnt down during the crisis. So I have no village to go and say, okay, this is my father's village. This is my father's village. But I have a mother's village. So uh, it's... Uh, it's 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 rich everyone one way or the other from the Niger Delta. It's it touches everyone one way or the other. And um, I personally, there were there were there were there were instances where crisis will just uh, break out, uh, sudden day bright sunshine, and you start hearing bullets everywhere, gunshot, people running for their lives, and. In those instances, many people lost their lives through straight bullets. And I, that's why I one of the things that I was, I'm, I'm thankful that, okay, for life, because uh, there were at least two instances where crisis erupt. You see militant, uh, uh, militant youth with real uh, magazines, uh, uh, ammunition that's, really, really um, um, dangerous and just shooting and um, burning houses 
especially in two instances I was there, that was very, uh, very near, you know, very near to all, all that it, it implied, you know. So, um, so that those two instances, you know, it's like personal experience of the crisis. And in my grandmother's village, which is JC, uh, you see oil, oil explosions. It's frequent in the Niger Delta, but these are close experiences to me. In JC, there have been several, several oil explosions, but in this particular instance, it's exploded and the village, the just because you know the villages are like little um, group of villages. So it's not like a city. The fire like roasted at least a thousand people. And during, during that time, during that time, we watched the news. This was my grandmother's village. We watched the news in, um, on the TV and we saw uh, children, mothers, people on the road or on the, on the village ground burnt by crude oil, this crude oil that we used to drive cars here in Europe, in America, and in the Western world. In Europe, it look, the oil, when you take it from the forest station, it looked very innocuous. But where it's being take it, uh, taken, taken from, uh, people are getting burnt uh, in the thousands. Due to poorly maintained oil wells and pipelines where yes. there was regulation like there is in the West, it wouldn't be happening. So it's it's uh, the lack of maintenance uh, and Amnesty have, have emphasized that in two recent reports, one in, tw in 2017 and one in 2020, that, um, that the pipelines have not been properly maintained in the wells and that's what's um, leading to the explosions. Yeah. So, um I searched even uh, recently on YouTube, and I found that even the instance of Jesse, my grandmother's village, is there on YouTube. So it's not that these are stories people are telling. You just put it J E S S E. You just put it on YouTube, and you see. And it's the Nigel Delta is like a, it's like a group of, uh, it's like it's always called the Delta regions. There are a lot of or waters and oil around that thing. But at the same time, it's still under pressure and oppression from even from the same country citizens from different parts of the country. You know, I love every part of Nigeria. I want to see every part developed, uh, developed to the best. But if you see a place like Abuja, which is the capital, and you, you look at there is if you group all the Niger Delta together. The infrastructure in the Niger Delta, every part of the Niger Delta group together, is still not up to 1% of what you will see in Abuja, or let me not be too extreme. Uh, it's still not in comparison to what you will find in Abuja. And Abuja is not, it's, it's, it's being funded by the resources, almost 100% by the resources from the Niger Delta. Yeah. Lagos was almost built by the resources from the Niger Delta. All these cities, you know, and still in the same country, you see the Niger Delta, uh, they, are, they are severely oppressed. Imagine somebody said, we need, the Niger Delta need help. And the very next day he was crucified, he was executed. It's, it tells of, uh, it tells of leadership as well. Why the, the multinational corporations they have they have uh, imposed very brutish uh, system, but still the people, the the the, the sun tanned skinned people, uh, impose on themselves as well um, very brutish form of tribalism. And I think, Jack, we should explain for the audience that um, that the the kind of the way that the, the state was kind of raked by the departing colonial powers was to put all of the power in the hands of one constituency and subject them to others. And 
it was because um, Magella McCarran understood that the experience of being a minority in Northern Ireland, where she was a member of the Catholic community, that she was able to connect with that. We have a we had a similar situation here in Ireland in the in the seventies and eighties where the Catholic community were um, smaller in number and they were, um, you know, the, the, they didn't have adequate representation at the level of government. And, um, and it, was, it was a similar setup. So that's the same with the, the communities in the Niger Delta, their minority communities and the way the state was essentially rigged when the decolonization occurred led to imbalances and lack of representation. And when Sarawi were formed Mossop, movement for the survival of the Agoni people and issued the Bill of Rights, one of his re requests or requirements was that the, the minorities in the Delta and the Agoni in particular, whom he was representing, would have appropriate democratic representation in government. Right. So, Jack, can you tell me a little bit about your sense of Irishness? Because you've been in Ireland for a while now. Yeah, that's uh, that's very beautiful question. Thanks for that. It's um, the state is um, negotiating uh, uh, cross cultural identity, negotiating cross cultural identity, and um, I think personally, uh, it's it's hard. It's hard to. It's like it's like rivers. It's like waters. I say waters and. Say stone. It's hard, like, to for a stone to be water, or for water to be stone. And one learn over time that it could be like what is called like Irish insularism. It's almost impossible for an immigrant to be an Irish in terms of uh, cultural identity. What well, I think which is called insularism. The Irish in So I think it's unique about the Irish um, people. And the Irish people are, you know, they are Asian civilization. And it could it could almost like uh, compete with civilization like the Egyptian civilization because you see their, their monuments are there, the domains and other things that testifies of the Asianness of the people. So they have lived a particular way for thousands of years, steadily, and uh, been in a particular place for thousands of years, constantly. So it's hard for somebody to just come within a few years and be able to understand what has been passed on for thousands of thousands of years to through the, through the generation. And so personally, I think it's a very difficult thing, but I still strive to, I still strive, strive to be, um, to, to, to represent the Irish culture. Uh, so in, in, in many of my works, uh, you see I reference names that mean so much to me. Uh, I've been to a lot of places, but it's still that constant negotiation, constant negotiation with the land and with the people yeah. to be part of, part of them. Jack, you wrote a poem for us tonight. Would you like to read it and share it with us now? Yes. And we should, I'll explain to the audience while Jack is sharing. Jack has written a long poem that was kind of inspired by the connections. And he was he was inspired by a Sinead's film, Blood Fruit, when, when I kind of linked the pair, our pair of creatives up. And he's written a long poem and he's, he's going to read an excerpt from it tonight for us. It begins with a quotation from one of Sarah Wewa's poems. This first poem is written by King Sarawiwa. Mama came calling. She came visiting today. The lovely little lady. In her hand, a dainty meal of not less palm fruits. A long forgotten delicacy. From my childhood days, into which I dug my faith as my baby gums have rest and found therein once again the Mickey sweet 
of a mother's blessing. This photo on screen is a deja vu. These tools use sawdust and firewood of where? I recall how to use these tools during the terrible years of West scarcity in the 1990s. If only there were constant electricity for light, there wouldn't be much dependency on oil. Explosions and spills are frequent, if not yearly. 19th of October, 1998, an oil pipeline exploded in Jesse in the Delta. An inferno that raged for five days and killed over a thousand people. The dead were all like burnt shackles. Babies trapped to the backs of their mothers, silenced, caught up in a sudden mass cremation. Can you tell us how many people you buried today? A rescuer was asked. I can't fit tell Amo because not only me, we are plenty of people, he said. He meant to say he cannot count the total because many rescuers carried out the barrier. The Niger Delta crisis lasted for many years. All cities and villages were burnt down by fighting you. Bullets ravaged the air like rain slanted by wind. People once bounded by blood for centuries were split apart by crude oil. Distrust runs deeper than the Mariana Trench monotolemia beneath their sun-tanned skins. Hearts run wide in their bleeding veins. Like the cracked shells of the turtles and tortoises, like the sequestered rivers of the Delta, the tribes were broken. Like dried bunga peaches, their togetherness was broken. If only there were healings among the forest, one may seek to be comforted, but there are not yet healings, only hollow voices that screams. If only there were bombs in the gardens, one may seek to be so called. Yeah, by the leafy rivers of Dublin. There by the barrel of Shore, river of Port Lerigo, I weep. I weep for Walcott, a far cry from Africa. I weep for Ashibe. Things fall apart again and again and again. Oh, Hogan, stones, oh, Dome, oh, Our Lady of Apostle, Hola, summon softly your sweet influence till we in the Delta recover our songs. Could oil creeks, cities, swamps, ponds, 
putiteros and tilapia, bangas and coconuts, cocoa yams and potatoes. Often we see the brutish impositions and consequences of oil revenues rub their tongues on the land like snails and Congo meat. Kwame, they are vultures roosting in ancestral savanna, trees of West Africa, like in Odibo bush market. Critical words are too risky for the hypocritical. Little. Instead, I prefer to tell you of the clear genius of Ken Sarawiwa. He leaves his idea in perpetuity. The ongoing humanitarian crisis is as persistent and prevailing as the COVID-19 pandemic. So we uphold one uncommon chandelier's candle of Candace, queen of the Ethiopia, queen of Addis Ababa. Bonnie, Bonnie, by pledge, this burning is true to our one root as nursing the drama drums the doomsday of the delta. My carver market women talking of the rumors from the geologists. Igbudu and Kwesu, women of the coming time when all the oil wells will be dried up. Then oil weeks we look like those empty copper shells we found on the strands of Balimo, Potna, Shaga, and Molagmo. But what general soul will look kindly to this region when these resources are all gone? Thank you very much for that, Jack. That was really wonderful. That was a really astonishing poem and we really appreciate you presenting it to us for the first time on this very special occasion to commemorate Ken Sarawiwa. Sinead, can I bring you in now? And Jack, feel free to jump in at any point as well. That was Should an amazing you... poem, Jack. Well done. It was beautiful. Thank yeah. You. Sinead, can you tell me how you connect with this event today? Um, well, I connect with it because you phoned me up and asked me to do it. And yeah. I think you know, I, I hadn't heard of Ken Sowiwa at all. I'd never heard of him. And I actually Googled him before I replied to you. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe I've never heard of this guy. Um, I mean, to me, he's kind of like a, a total, like, Steve Biko or something like that. There was something extraordinary about this man where, you know, the cause comes ahead of your own needs in life. So that that was just amazing to me. Um, and my instant thought was I want to make a documentary about him. But that's another day's work. So basically, and then you contacted me because of a documentary I'd made called Blood Fruit. And uh, I'll just give you a quick brief on that. That is basically a documentary that was made about the Dunstory Strikers in Ireland in 1984. Um, it was during the height of apartheid, probably its worst times. And there was a group of um, nine young women and one young man who went out on strike. It was started by Mary Manning, who refused to sell a, great, a South African grapefruit. And with that, she was suspended and everybody went out with her. Now, for me, that documentary was interesting because of that, but what really made it interesting for me was what was their inspiration? And there was a bit of kind of forgotten history there, which 
you know, I think because it was such a good story that was this, these young women, even the man who went on strike got forgotten about, like the white man. But there was a man called Nimrod Sajaki. He was born in um, Johannesburg in, I think, 1920. He was born the same year as Nelson Mandela. And he kind of would have run the same route as Nelson Mandela. There was a lot of freedom fighters working against apartheid underground at that time. He was part of the ANC. He was in jail with Nelson Mandela and um, it was during the treason t trials. And also he would have been part of the signing of the agreement in Clipstown that all of the these guys, they eventually got done for. He happened to be in Ireland in 1984 when he heard about the strike. So he went to the picket line 10 days into the strike and then he went, he was on strike with them for the whole time. Now, I think the most interesting part of Nimrod Sajaki was is that he was able to educate them in a way that nobody else could have. He was a black man from Johannesburg who had actually fought the fight. He had left his homeland. He had left his family. He was able to, um, you know, tell them stories of what was really going on. I mean, Ireland was a very religious country at the time and run by the church. And you had these nuns running around going, oh, what are you doing? supporting the Dunstore strikers. They're causing, you know, they're stopping people in South Africa getting work. But Desmond Tutu was going, stop buying the goods because this is the economically money. It, it, money is the only thing that talks very much, you know, as Jack has been talking about in his country, you know, you had a hierarchical system. Colonialism, as they were edging out, they basically, I, I mean, as soon as you're saying that to me, I think, you know, South Africa or Africa's continent is the most abused continent on earth. And one of the reasons being is because it is so rich. It is so mineral rich. It is so gold rich. It's got everything that people, so they go and they pillage there. But, you know, it's like, that's a typical shift of hierarchy. You take the colonials out and you just put somebody else in charge and they're getting all the money. And they're probably still dealing with the old power that are, you know, that have just shifted. So for the Dunstore strikers, they had Nimrod Sajaki, who basically would have taught them everything. Another thing that I found quite interesting, and I'm sure, Jack, you can kind of uh, hopefully agree with me on this, is something I've learned, because I'm working on two other documentaries, which I'll tell you one about later. And they're both, one is I'm co-directing with an, uh, an Irish or a Nigerian woman called Dr. Ivan Joseph. And the second one is about George Nenchenko, the Nigerian man who was shot, young man who was shot in West Dublin um, in uh, December 30th, 2020. And from working with the Nenchenko family and Dr. Ivan Joseph, I've learned that history in Africa was very much told by storytelling. A lot of it wasn't written down. So is this true, Jack, where basically your father and your grandfather and your grandmother, they would tell you stories and that's how they would educate you about your history. Yeah. And it's still going on to the present. Yeah. It still goes on. So when Nimrod Sajaki arrived on the picket line, he told them stories. I mean, they said he didn't tell them, oh, you know, everything's really bad. He told them stories. And this is how he educated them. He gained their interest. So that strike went on for two years and nine months. And every one of the strikers says that it would not have gone on for as long and they would not have won the battle if it wasn't for Nimrod Sajaki. So within Blood Fruit, I felt it was my job to, you know, reawaken his kind of history and let people know who he was. And um, just one other thing is that as part of the documentary, um, we went to South Africa. Nelson Mandela died when the documentary was being made. So I went with the strikers to South Africa and we made a point of trying to contact Nim Nimrod. So Jackie was dead at this point, but we contacted his family and we went to visit them. And I think that was the most moving part of every aspect of this story for the strikers. Because we went to see his children, who were now in their um, probably late 50s, early 60s. And they were living in a township in Johannesburg. Now, it wasn't by no means the worst township, but it was obviously not great. And when we got there, you know, they were, you know, pleased to meet the strikers. But they were quite honest. They said their life hadn't changed. So it's like you're talking about in Nigeria that, you know, they, they said our passes are gone. We can move around, but our, we have no jobs. You know, they, they were living in the same house as Nimrod had left them in the 60s. And it was a tiny house and the whole family was still living there. So it's kind of like, a, you know, it's a, it, all of that contradictory um, behaviour and all of that hierarchical system. I find that fascinating about the whole, the whole of Africa. I think it's, it's such an abused continent. But look, 
what I'll do is I'll show you a quick um, trailer for Blood Fruit, which is the simplest way for you to understand a little bit about it. Um, just to say, I just want to give you a bit of a warning. The use of the N-word is in it. So I, I, I obviously, this at the time, you know, and that's ignorance on my part and, and the um, Dunstore Strike, this was made in 2014. Um, and this is just the trailer. Now it's not used in a, it's one of the strikers describing what she was called, but I do want to warn anybody of that before I show it. Okay, so I'll share the screen now. Our children are dying. Our land is burning and bleeding. And so I call on the international community to apply punitive sanctions They'd be saying, why are you doing this for the niggers? They wouldn't be doing it for you and all this. And I was like, how do people think like that? We want to build jointly but separately in South Africa. We want to live jointly but separately. And if people from abroad would just leave us alone, we are going to pan out to become the greatest country in the Southern Hemisphere. Brutality and ruthlessness. We are the artillery of the South African police. We'd never met anybody that was black. It was like, where did he come from? What's he doing here? What does he want? This was tainted fruit, and it was tainted by the blood of black South African people. That's brilliant. Sinead, thanks for sharing that. I think one of the reasons I asked you how you connect with the event was that you, you told me that you hadn't heard of Ken Sarawiwa and it was a time before we had social media and before things could be filmed. You know, we had the evidence of George Floyd's murder and it, that was a thing that really garnered support for Black Lives Matter. But Ken Sarawiwa was writing in a context where he was just thanks to have a, a scholarship, he had received an education and he knew how to read and write. But most of his family and most of the people in his community didn't. And, you know, when he was locked up in jail and there was all this government propaganda that he was a murderer, that he had incited murder, that murders had been committed in his name or for his movement. And he just kept writing. He wrote to Magella McCarran. He wrote to the Anita Roderick in the body shop. He wrote to Jimmy Carter. He was liaising with the United Nations and the unrepresented people, a nations organization in the Hague. He tried to raise funds for Agoni relief through the Catholic Church and different aid organizations. And as a writer, he was in touch with other writers and with Penn International. And by writing, he managed to get the story of Agoni and the, the crisis there out. And even when he was on death row, he heard the news. And once he heard him, his name being spoken on the BBC and on the Voice of America, he, he knew that he said, like, even though I'm going to die, the cause will not now yeah. die. And he, he knew he was going to, to carry it on. So I was, I, was at, I was thinking about you making documentaries about people, you know, about why, it's, why is it important for you, Sinead, to tell the stories of people's lives? I don't know. Well, it's because it's interesting. Yeah. You know, like, it's very interesting to get inside the mind of any human being, but in particular, somebody who's done something special. You know, actually, I think it's quite interesting that you're saying about Ken that, you know, he knew he was going to die. Stephen Biko knew that he was going to die. And apparently one of the reasons why they never put Nelson Mandela to, that they, they never executed him was quite simply because of what happened after Stephen Biko died. They made a martyr of him. And I kind of wonder, I don't know the full story, did Ken become a martyr? Like, did cha things change after he died? after the nine were killed was that a was that a turning point in the whole kind of legal battle yeah and i mean i should be clear that ken didn't take risks unnecessarily with his life and he did hope you know in in the letters you can see a kind of uh sort of moving back and forth between thinking he he will be locked up for a few years and then he might be released when the government was changed or, you know, a kind of dawning awareness that actually they have rigged this trial and he is going to face the death penalty. 
But um, after he died, there was such a global outcry um, and the, Nigeria faced sanctions, economic sanctions. And it was the beginnings of a movement toward, uh, you know, the awareness of, of corporate social responsibility. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. You know, it was the, the publicity that Ken garnered for the cause that drew the attention of human rights organizations and then of Western governments. And he kept saying in his letters that it was, you know, he was depending on the conscience of the West because yeah. there was no regulation in Nigeria during that time. And so he was really depending on people to support people in the West to 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 protest, to um, advocate for fair, you know, fair uh, treatment of the communities from where their resources come. And um, and we, we can see in the recent civil cases in the Netherlands that some of Ogoni farmers have won uh, compensation for the damage to their farms. And we say um, hello to Na Sarawiwa and Owen Swiwa who visited us. We support their call for the full exoneration of, of Ken Sarawiwa and the other Ogoni nine. Sinead, yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, I, you know, I think that, you know, just storytelling for me is just like once I hear, I, I'll know instantly if I want to make something like you, you hear about it and then you just get a thread and then you kind of run with it. Like with something like the Dunstore Strikers, that was just, I, I knew that was going to be a huge documentary instantly. I, I, I just find the whole continent of Africa very interesting now. Like, I mean, I think it's very interesting what you say about, um, George Floyd and social media, people give out about social media all the time, but they kind of seem to forget that it's changed a lot of people's lives for the good. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I don't agree with all the social media, but what happened with George Floyd, like that has been happening for centuries and centuries and it's caught on camera. But I do think that we all have a great kind of ability to turn a blind eye and pretend it, it, we have to be faced with the material for us to do something about it. And that was a moment in time, it was also COVID-19, so it didn't get brushed under the carpet. Everybody was glued to their screens, you know? But I think it's kind of interesting. I mean, you're talking about, you know, the Agoni farmers going to the Netherlands and they're getting compensation. But what is the compensation for a life destroyed? You know, your land destroyed, your children's upbringing destroyed, you know, all the mental illness that would come from that. Like, I mean, that's why, you know, the, the root of the problem has to be tackled. You know what I mean? And like the corporate problem. I, I always refer back to, uh, which was my favourite book when I was a teenager. And obviously, I think most people in Ireland read it as part of their curriculum, Animal Farm. And I think that the problem is, is that when most people get into power and they get money, they become greedy. How do we conceptualize Irishness now once we kind of start learning these stories? I mean, I think we we tend to hear stories of Irish national heroes. Sinead, you made stories about the, the eight women and one man, working class people who went out on strike and not only brought about sanctions against South Africa and Ireland, but, but across Europe effectively. Um, it's a different kind of heroism, isn't it? And a different, it, it sort of changes our idea of our identity. I think that cross-cultural alliance between Nimrod Sajaki and the the strikers. Yeah, I think it's probably all down to class. I mean, they were they were all of the same class. They were bottom of the pecking order, so they were able to connect quite quickly on the issues. You know, I mean, none of the strikers were well-off people. You know, they all came from kind of they, most of them lived at home. They were really young. So, with in terms of Irish society, they were definitely uh, uh, towards the bottom. And also, you know, in 1984, a young woman. You know, you were a woman and that was it, you know, and, um, you know, the same was, I mean, as we as we were talking about Ken there, um, he was educated and so was Nimrod Sajaki. He, he was a teacher, very unusually. He was educated and educated because he went to um, a Christian school. There just happened to be a Christian school right by where he lived. Otherwise, he wouldn't have been educated and obviously wouldn't have been able to do all the things that he did. But I don't know, Jack, you step in there. I feel like I've been talking constantly here. Yeah, Jack. Yes. Yeah, that's nice. um, like um, like as Shanae said because you not know, I told you Shanae your documentary was very amazing and I I watched some of your other work and the people as well that spoke is in it like Ness Mandela, Ness Matutu. Those are like very important voices when it uh, comes. Uh, 
comes to the context of Africa, you know, the dialogue of the progress of uh, Africa in diaspora. And saying that the, the successful struggle of the South Africans uh, is largely as well due to the participation of the Irish. You see, that is a very, very important statement. You see, it's a statement that if people are aware about, it's going to like reverberate throughout the coast of Africa because that is very, very significant. It's not just anyone that just said that. It's, it, it's like one of those rare, rare uh, figures, rare people in Africa that people are uh, think that, okay, these are the people that shape the consciousness of the uh, sun-tanned people. And so what I'm trying to say is that, that the, the contribution of the Irish like it changed the, the future of South Africa and as well, which is Africa. Uh, I did some research back, uh, some why into like the involvement of Irish in uh, Nigeria. And you see that like 200 years ago, a lot of Irish people, they traveled to Nigeria to do missionary works. And these uh, missionaries and other Irish that did different things, they lived and they died in Nigeria happily. The Irish has actually invested culture into uh, the, the present dimension of uh, Nigeria or rather the West Africa. And these are recorded, they are books. And the names are of a lot of places in West Africa. You see, they are bearing Irish names because it shows a testament of the people that were there building the place and the, the left. This is why we were talking about storytelling today, that the stories we tell really shape our impressions of ourselves. And we, we often have, we, you know, there, there, we've, we've talked about the fact that Ken Sarawiwa's own story is, is quite hidden really for the stature he had, um, because he really introduced a new era of cor uh, corporate social responsibility. And his, his daughter, Naw has written, if you Google date with history, you'll, you'll have a, a more thorough going account of, of that. But there are all these histories of, of, of migration. And, you know, we tend to think of ourselves as rooted and as being in one place for thousands of years. But then there are also all of these interlocking histories of migration and solidarity, as well as of, um, of, of difficulty in those encounters. So I'm just aware, I just want to say hi to Sam Adagoki because he's in the audience um, from LA and I can see Sam, you've got your hand up, but unfortunately the Eventbrite is set up so that we can't bring people in. But Sam, if you'd like to put a question in the chat, we could read it. Sam is making a film about Ken Sarawiwa and he's using the text of Silence Would Be Treason as well in the film. And hi to Sophie Clark, who says, um, thank you for the beautiful reading, Jack. And she's asking, Jack, do you write or think in your birth language and then translate it into English? Or are your thoughts in English? Uh, like this piece, I wrote it in, uh, I wrote it in, uh, in uh, English. And in the in the process of writing, it's like there is this. It's, it's also a battle in the mind, you know, to 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 stay pure and uh, to the language one is writing. Because there's also this coming up of other other languages that are taught. Like in the, it's a long work. It's a long. Uh, it's a book, and still a book that is not completed. But in, in the work, you see, I, I still included other languages as well. Sometimes very brief, sometimes very brief, just to show that I acknowledge the consciousness that surrounds me, the languages that I hear that I'm not expressing when I express in English. So I was talking about like greetings. Great. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jack. 
Um, I just would ask anybody who wants to ask more questions, you can type in the chat. We're coming up to the hour now. We've uh, we've been running for an hour. Um, Sinead, I know you had another clip that you wanted to show us of your more, most recent film. Yeah, I don't, I don't have to show it. And to be honest with you, I kind of feel like it would, it's such a, it's quite controversial. <laughs> and it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's a bit different than what we've been talking about. I know, but I think that's really important. It's important okay. for us to talk about the racism as well, I think. Okay, that, yeah. That's a real well, then, part of the encounter we're talking about. And the, yeah. so I'm really glad that you, you have that for us. Okay, so um, on the 30th of December, 2020, George Nanchenko, a young man, uh, an Irish Nigerian, who'd moved here when he was seven years old to West Dublin with his parents. West Dublin was... A difficult area at the time, but just being um, a young black man in Ireland was going to be difficult anyway. I mean, I think it probably still is. That's a whole different story. But this, what happened this day was that he had been suffering from mental health issues for some time. He left his house and he was having an episode when he left his house. Uh, kind of, They think it was psychosis. They're now saying that it could be re related to racism growing up. And uh, George's best friend, had, one of his best friends had been killed in a racist attack when they were only 15. So, you know, at the age of 27, for about two or three years, he'd been suffering from quite difficult mental health issues to the point that two weeks before the shooting, he'd actually phoned the local police himself and said, I think I'm going mad. You know, I don't know what's going on here. I'm hearing voices in my head. The police called around, they calmed him down, they calmed the family down, and they, he was on the list to be sectioned. So what happened was he left the house that morning and he went to his local shop. He got into an altercation. He had carried with him a butter knife. The family think he probably carried it as protection because he was having psychosis. It is still, we still don't know if he actually attacked somebody in the shop. There's no proof of that. Um, there's no proof that he didn't, but it, it, I think it's more likely that he got into an altercation. There was no injuries or anything like that. Then on his way home, he was followed by police. Um, the kind of it, it all escalated so quickly. First of all, he was followed by a couple, a few police. There was a few police cars. And for some reason, the armed unit was called. And by the time he got back to his house and to his front door, he knocked on the front door and he was trying to get in. Anyway, the trailer will kind of tell you some more. You know, it'll tell you about this, but basically. He left the house at, I think, 12 in the morning and by 25 past 12, he was dead. It was extraordinary. Um, and this documentary, which we're doing, is called Six Bullets Fired, because that's the amount of times that he was shot. It's about many things. It's a multi-layered documentary. First of all, it's kind of a thriller-like investigation into what happened that day over those 20 minutes. It's a story about a, a young man's life. Um, the Nanchenko family, I just remember saying to them, you know, what do you want from this documentary and they want no revenge. They want nothing like that. They just want their son to be humanized. And the reason for that is because when George, within hours of George being shot, there was a social media campaign that went out and it said that he'd been convicted 32 times, he had 32 criminal convictions. He'd hammered his girlfriend with a knife or with a, with a hammer on the head. Um, and it kind of was that the guy a guy in the spa that he'd been in he'd slashed him they put up images of this guy who'd been slashed at an Everton match two years beforehand it was all misinformation so the documentary is also asking us to ask ourselves it's about preconception so I just want to kind of get into a bigger picture of what we believed, I mean, it took three days for the police to confirm that George had no criminal conviction. They could have done that within an hour. There's a lot of dubious kind of behavior there that people are wondering why it took three days. But in those three days, the information about him being a criminal who hammered his girlfriend, who'd slashed a guy in a spa and he ended up getting something like 63 stitches, all that misinformation, all those lies were in the psyche of the Irish people. And there was no way for him or his family, he was dead, or for his family to pull back from that. His family have had racist attacks, they've had to move home. So it's kind of like, I, and one of the reasons is because I come from South County Dublin, I come from a place called Monkstown, which is posh, okay? So I'm a white woman. If I ask anybody in my neighborhood, oh, what do you think of George Nanchenko? They go, oh, the guy who stabbed somebody and then he hammered his girlfriend on the head. I'm not going, no, he never did any of those things. They're going, really? So it's how we 
believe so quickly and then don't look into things. Do you know what I mean? So it's it's really about questioning ourselves and also humanizing a young man's life. So look, I'm, what I'm showing you now is we are, we've only gone into production on this. We only started shooting and we have a thing called a trailer a promo, a teaser, which we use to raise finance. So this is the trailer. I mean, this was actually made a couple of months ago and a lot of stuff has kind of changed, but look, this will give you an idea of the direction that we're going. So I'm gonna go into share content now and hope this plays. While Sinead is getting that set up, I just uh, read a question. Oh, sorry, is that not playing? No, Sinead, it's not. I thought that was playing. Okay, just let me go back. Okay, so Sam Adegoki, um, filmmaker in LA, he's, um, he plays uh, Jeff in the new version of Dynasty as well. He says, thanks so much and hello. I joined late and I'm actually filming now, but wanted to jump in for a bit. I feel like there's a gap in awareness of the oil crisis in Nigeria and some low hanging fruit in terms of putting that awareness out. I've been attempting to partner with Oil Watch International. I'm wondering what sorts of organizations exist that we can really get behind in addition to trying to tell Ken's story that can garner awareness and support for the Delta people and the environmental crisis they continue to face. So a great question from Sam. Um, that we don't just want to tell the story, but we tell the story for a purpose. And um, the question is really how, what, what do we do about it? Once we know that story, what do we do about it? And we hope that the, the seminar tonight will be um, the beginnings of that, um, you know, of, of... I'll press play now. Yeah. Thank you. Sinead, thanks very much for showing us that clip of your new film. You know, it's very prescient and it's it's of the moment and very close to us as well. Yeah, look, hopefully we're kind of working to get it made so that we'll just, fingers crossed. Come here, Dan, you know, the guy who was just talking there, I'm sorry, I didn't get his name. Um, I, the uh, I think there. that is really interesting because I think what is interesting is that like, you know, you can sit and discuss something like this, but certain things there's very direct ways of helping and people know how to do that what do you do like I would like to know what do you do to raise awareness nobody I wouldn't know I'd say most people who are watching don't know so what is the advice there well I think we just have to stick our heads together but I think like um we can write to our TDs we can call for investigations into Shell um we can join Friends of the Earth, we can make sure that the fuel being imported to our country is not, uh, when, when it comes here, imported frack gas, that the communities um, from where it's taken are not being suffering the same, similar kinds of the ecological crises and that they are 
Um, you know, their health is not suffering from the ways in which these resources are being extracted, obviously. Jack, what do you think we need to do? Uh, I, agree, I agree with you uh, completely. I think uh, in this present uh, day of media and uh, people try to have a no further cautious. I think seminars like this are very effective uh, means uh, mediums to create awareness uh, because it's uh, it's it's uh, when this uh, awareness uh, created not violently but uh, in a way that the 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 people that makes decisions can accept because that is the essence of poetry and that is the the aim of poetry. Poetry can speak to a detector in a way that he accept or someone that is very tyrannical in a way he or she we accept. I think poetry is the only language that could do that. So I think seminar like this are languages that could create awareness without being too violent. Uh, because all, uh, protest is good. So, um, in protests, uh, they, are, they, are, they are part of expressions as well. But I think seminars like this, they, they run their course and create the awareness and it has a it, the, the people that make decision can easily swallow swallow their own. Because if you look at Ken Sarua Kill, that was a clear instance of pride and arrogance that the top leaders of Africa were speaking to Nigeria that please don't do this. Still, the leaders for because it's like issue of pride and power and uh, this thing. So they still uh, went ahead and carried out the execution to show that sometimes direct, direct um, conversation among the top might not, might not soften the heart of those that make decisions. It's so, it's so, it's, it was so painful that uh, Mandela, the, the, the leaders, you see them after the, the execution, they were saying that we, 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 we did our best, we did our best, but they said that they were let down. Uh, even Mugabe was particularly saying that he was disappointed by the leadership of uh, Nigeria that they didn't listen to him and it shows that uh, sense of pride at this time. So I think uh, seminars are good. Uh, people now, they have uh, indiv individual, uh, is it called editors, uh, producers, People can produce their content and put it out there for consumptions. Yeah. So I think, yeah, individual producers are increasing. I think then writers, uh, they put their content out there in a way that does not offend the people that are going to make the decision to uh, effect change. So I think um, mm -hmm. these are one of the ways to uh, increase awareness. Thanks, Jack. I'm just going to ask some questions here, and we are coming up to an hour and a half, so we'll just take one or two questions. Um, uh, John McGeady says, hi to Sinead and Jack, and thanks for your contributions. As artist, poet, and filmmaker, do your creative projects flow from stories of injustice you encounter, or do you intentionally seek out stories of injustice and then apply your craft? And if you would speak a little bit more about the role of the artist or the creative in the public or political sphere, and, and if you think it is a useful way of looking at it, I'm not quite sure what he means by the end, but the, the, um, if you think it's useful to think about the artist as having a public or political role, I think that's what the question is. But um, maybe you could answer the first question. Do you seek out stories of injustice or do, you, do they come sort of flow from your own encounters your own experiences i don't really know like stories generally come to you you don't generally seek them out they're funny kind of like you know it depends what you mean by come to you like say something like you know the done stories strike was just a documentary that had never been made 
Do you know what I mean? And there was several people trying to make it. And then eventually, you know, we got funded. And but that was kind of like, you know, that was a story that needed to be told. And then something like the George Nanchenko thing, you know, I'd read about it again. You generally find if there's a good story, there's about five people trying to make it. That's just kind of the way it goes, you know. And I, I'm actually, the, the whole point about the artist kind of like, I mean, being a force of persuasion for change, I think is really important. Um, and what Jack is saying there is incredibly important. And that can happen on so many different levels. You know, poetry would, is so impactful. And, you know, when I think about Seamus Heaney now and what, you know, you, you know, the written word is now part of the Irish curriculum. And that tells, uh, you know, my daughter has, you know, obviously I didn't read him in school, but my daughter reads him in school. And she has such a great understanding of Northern Ireland because of that, you know, just because of that, that poetry. So I think that's really impactful. And I think in the long term for people to look back, it, it's such an impactful thing. And I love the idea of kind of, you know, trying to persuade people in that medium. Like I suppose with documentary, that's, it's, it's much more kind of factual and, you know, we state things as they are rather than maybe disguise them as something else. But I suppose the idea of, you know, poetry or the written word embarrassing people into doing something about it, you know what I mean? Or kind of like changing their way of thinking. You know, I think that's hugely important. And I think it's a, you know, we are a world full of protest at the moment about everything. And people, I think, are sometimes a bit sick of it. Everything is a protest now. And it does kind of sometimes demean the things that really, really, really matter. So sometimes you have to think of different routes of getting there. And, you know, it's just, it, it's the world that we live in at the moment, I think. Yeah, and Sinead, I think also like um, speaking to the people who are, uh, you know, vulnerable and hearing back from them. And I think that's one of the powerful things about the um, trailer you just showed for the George and Ken show film that um, you know, we're hearing yeah. from the family. We're not just hearing the noise on Twitter, but we're actually hearing the actual human stories from the family. And also to know, like Jack is, has shared with us his stories as well, which have you know roots in his own experience. And it's it's good to to actually hear to to the, the conversation is is important. Sam again says. Um, I love these ideas, would volunteer myself and platform as an ambassador of any kind. I think Instagram and social media are a great starting place to post images and share and at a minimum keep sparking the conversation. I too often in the Western world, we see crisis as a their problem over there. But when you consider that the equivalent of the Exxon Valde oil spill is occurring in Nigeria nearly every three years and oil pollution off the Gulf of Guinea washes right up into the Gulf of Mexico, perhaps through visual and galvanizing visuals and galvanizing my fellow entertainment folks in partnership with uh, an established environmental organization could move the needle. So he's talking about the, you know, the potential of the, the message that film can spread to, um, to garner political support, public support and put pressure on our representatives. And he says also the documentaries by Sinead look amazing and he looks forward to watching it. And uh, yeah, so perhaps an offline conversation um, and we, we will keep in touch with Sam as well. And any other final comments we'd, you'd like to make our participants before I could ask um, Jack to, to just read another selection. Has anybody, either of you got anything else you'd like to say? No, the only thing I'd like to say is that I, I, I think that the story of Ken, Sarah, we were, is just amazing. And I think you said Sam is doing a movie on it. Yeah, he's so, doing biofiction, a biofiction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If you want to contact me to talk about that, do. I, lo I, I, I just think this is a story that needs to be told. I think it's incredible and it's... Uh, it's impactful and also I think it's got like a, a lot of kind of I suppose you know it's got a lot of connection with what's going on today with climate change and all that kind of thing so I could imagine it could be an amazing film and also I love the idea of making people get ethically sourced oil I yeah. think that's really really important you know or even attempting that is a big move in the right direction yeah so um, just to close the evening then, Jack, can I ask you to read the other two poems that you were going to read for us tonight? Oh, all right. Yeah, thank uh, you. And uh, uh, thank uh, uh, 
Sinead for the, the um, creative um, question about the inspiration of the, of the artist. That's a very um, beautiful one. Um, yeah, well, you do, you do very important work. Yeah. Okay. Amatan. So this Amatan, you know, you're in the discussion, you know, that you're talking about the identity and feeling um, part of a, of a people. This uh, this one was written quite a while ago, and I was so happy that uh, Shimosini was able to read this poem, and he said that he liked it, he told me he liked it, and see, because I wrote this poem, after his work. So it's still a kind of, um, uh, uh, kind of like feeling at home, trying to negotiate the balance between both places. So this, this work is called Hamatan, after Shimos Ine Digi. Outside my window, the digger is digging. He plunges his spade into the gravelly ground that eases needle edge sharp sound into palpable rhythm as green boards crack in the dry hamata that shows dust around. The land trenches longer and deeper by each successive bleed of the spade. During the spade's area suspension, it pauses, stares into blue haze that mirages over on the noon highway. It thinks of the years he spent in Kirikiri prison, useless as free papers in a printing press. Of his friends who disappeared like methylated spirits, and his father's tutelage. Firewood is only for those who can take heart. That is why not all can gather heat. He shakes his head. Grip, grip, grip hard and down right down strikes the vengeful spade. In our head tight dragnet, roadblocks everywhere. Borders tight as steel zip locks, checkmate every progress. Yet many people of lesser talent slip out unabated with heat. The logic of existence replants us in alien soils. We tear around the helping corners of hope. So the periodic spade strikes. His stroke erupts desolation and hunger of the soul. Tribulations of a black gold age, the excavations and makings of our blood and drainage. Before the amatan and the digger for moving, I see it. Before their intimate vengeance, a washer, my pen, my spade, I'll crack with it. Dig with it. And the last one is uh, the palm kernel. The red palm kernel in between the screw steel is not a riddle. The songs from the truth of the generals contain secrets. My late grandmother never knew how to swim. But on market days, she would go and buy cocoa yams, paddling a canoe over River Etio, from Hagalope to Jesse. 
Asian towns in Niger Delta. She had a cassava farm to make her home Gary. She knows a lot about River Kentia. Yeah, thank you. Beautiful poem. Thank Bye. you so much, Jack. Yeah, thank Bye. you. It's beautiful. Thank you to both of you. This has been a wonderful conversation and I'd like to continue it. And thanks also to Sam for jumping in and to Sophie and John McGreedy and the other audience members. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's been a wonderful conversation. I hope we can continue the conversation in other venues, maybe in person at a later date. And good luck to both of you with your work, your ongoing work. Um, we hope we, we'll have a chance to bring you back to campus again soon. So thanks a lot, guys. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Nice to meet you, Jack. Thanks. Bye, thank you.